Um, I'm kind of hoping there'd be more new people. So, um, firm director, supervisors, scold the newbies after today. Make them watch. Um, okay, so today's training is going to be about 360A, 360B, and 350C. They're unrelated. Um, these are uh, some tools that um, maybe some of you guys are using. Um, maybe you aren't. Um, I think that it's worth discussing whether 360B is being overused. Um, so we'll get to that. Um, or if it is being used, if it's being used um, to the client's uh, best advantage. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. That is, uh, that's the beginning of 360A. Uh, it's actually a pretty uh, detailed statute. It goes into a lot of the specifics of the ins and outs of what's required, a lot more than a lot of the statutes do. Um, but that's sort of the preamble, if you will. Um, so 360A guardianship um, can be a really great way to kind of um, uh, avoid negative repercussions in the future or sort of just lock in um, something right from the get-go so you, so you don't have a sort of tenuous reunification period and possible TPR down the line. Um, so some of the advantages are that they would help uh, to avoid a future TFR or TPR. Um, the caregiver is not subject to the same requirements, the criminal labor requirements, as um, other caregivers would be required to meet. Um, there's less court involvement over time, the client has more control over the outcome, and uh, another advantage is that the waiver that's filled out for 360A, it specifically states that the uh, reunification waiver is conditioned on that particular person being the guardian. Um, if something happens with the guardianship, then the parent is put back in the same place and can um, reunify if they're qualified. Um, and also, if the guardianship fails, uh, the parent uh, is required to be noticed and may be considered for placement at that time, or they can file a future 388. Um, so at the beginning, when you're picking someone up at detention, or maybe shortly after detention, um, that's when you want to start thinking about, is this a good case for 360A guardianship? Um, I did put an asterisk there, because it can be a difficult uh, discussion to embark on with the client. Um, a lot of times people don't want to hear that their attorney is thinking, you know, maybe you don't want to reunify with your kid. So you have to really make sure that you handle it delicately. Um, but there are going to be times when it's pretty obvious from the start that you've got someone who may not ever reunify with their child. Um, so I listed several examples here um, that uh, might trigger you to think about having that discussion with your client. Um, obviously, they, this would be a situation where you're either um, having a family member assessed or a family member already has placement. Um, but just basically any situation similar to these where, where you're uh, presented with a potentially irresolvable mm -hmm. issue. Um, and something to keep in mind is you, if you're being rushed to um, do the detention and your client is fine with submitting and you go in and you do the detention, um, it may be that you don't think to have this conversation with your client until after the detention. So maybe you set a PRI on a uh, potential caregiver or you just have set a trial out. It's worth having that conversation at that point. Um, because it may be something that you can bring up to other counsel afterward, maybe um, have it walked on with an attorney in order to consider a 360A uh, for the dispo, because you want to get in front of that as early in the case as possible. Yes? I don't know where there are. Um, how does it avoid the uh, criminal waiver requirements? Doesn't the child have to be placed there subject to RFA? There is actual case law saying that um, those 
uh, requirements are not placed on the potential caregivers under 368, specifically because at the analysis is under best interest of the child. So they're not subject to the same waiver requirement. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so these are the requirements for 360A. There has to be a, a sustained petition. Um, the parent must advise the court that he or she is not interested in uh, family maintenance or family reunification. The court must determine legal guardianship is in the best interest of the child. The parent and the child, if they're old enough and able, uh, must agree to the appointment. The court must advise parent and child that reunification services will not be provided. And the court must order an assessment of the person whom the court anticipates appointing as the legal guardian. Uh, so they will be assessed pursuant to 361.5G. Um, it's in the um, statute itself that, um, under most circumstances, because they're pretty basic conditions, uh, the minor will qualify for King Gap funding. Question? My apologies if I missed this detail, but uh, when do we bring up uh, the 368 guardianship? Is it at the position, or uh, should we ask for an assessment at detention? You should ask for it at detention, which is why I brought up um, that if you don't get to it while you're doing your initial interview, I had a case recently where I ended up walking on the request after detention because it, it was one of those situations where we were kind of rushed, she was submitting to detention, everything seemed copacetic, and then afterwards she would, we realized um, that her deportation was probably going to happen, and so she really wanted to have that guardianship locked in before it happened, and so I just ended up locking it on after so that it would be part of the JDX report, and everyone was agreeable, so it was fine. And is it the court's discretion whether or not to... Um allow a 368 guardianship? Well, it's ultimately the court's decision based on all of those um, factors. But, um, right, so I think that if you've got a situation where everyone is kind of in agreement, it's unlikely the court's going to say, well, no, but it is ultimately an order of the court. So, yeah. Thank you. And did you have a question? I'll hold that. Okay. You might get it. Um, but yeah, so I was discussing this earlier that, um, uh, on the subject of Kim Gap, that there are definitely plenty of people who think that um, 368 would not qualify the guardian and the minor for Kim Gap, but it specifically does, and it's in the statute. Um, it also is in the statute that whoever prepares the assessment under 361.5 can be cross-examined, so I know some courts get kind of like with PRIs in particular, they say, well, this isn't going to be a hearing. Blah, blah, blah. So if anyone is pushing back on whether your client's entitled to a hearing on whether the caregiver is appropriate, you're, it's in the statute that they are. What the DCFS says, we want adoption because it's a newborn and legal guardianship by the maternal aunt who could be a permanent plan, but we're pushing for adoption. Well, with the... Where's your wiggle room in terms of saying, well, we, my client picks her sister to be the legal guardian, and shouldn't she be able to select who she wants as legal guardian for the child, and then the department just has to do the 351.5G assessment? Well, if the court orders them to do it, then the court orders them to do it. They can still have a position on whether or not they want the 368 guardianship to happen, but... They don't. They want somebody else to adopt. Right. If, if that's their position, that's their position. But you can still request that the court order the assessment, and the court can still order it, and they'd be ordered to do it, regardless of their position. So, um, And I just want to state that uh, if you think, ooh, 368 guardianship on a 387, too late. Too late. Um, so. Um, if you have picked up a client and they're the only parent there, they want guardianship with their sister or whoever, and um, just you might get some pushback, but it is possible to achieve that. You just want to also have uh, the department order to do a due diligence on the other parent. 
because if the court finds that that parent's whereabouts are unknown, then you can go forward with the 360-day guardianship. Um, and then that's the specific case addressing um, uh, the fact that criminal waivers don't apply. Um, yes? Okay. So, my question question is, um, so you only need the consent of one parent, the other parent is whereabouts and not. And if there are two parents and one parent says, no, I want a car, then for sure that's not going to happen, right? right. Yep. Yep. Um, and then I just, that's the form, JD419. Don't use your typical FR waiver. Um, it is not anywhere near as specific as this. And there's more to it than this. There's a section where it specifically says name of prospective legal guardian. If it falls through, we're back to square one. Now, I have two questions. Yes. Um, if there's a whereabouts unknown parent, they're supposed to have six months to appear. They're supposed to be given a grant of FR. So how does, what happens to the 360A if it's granted by the court and then another parent appears. I mean, I guess they have to, I, I don't know. But I suppose undoing it would certainly be on the table. Um, yeah. Wouldn't you just follow 3D? Like, yeah. I mean, what if they were bypassed between whatever? Yeah. I don't think so. And, and just say, and, and, and in pursuit of this case, it doesn't matter. You don't have to leave that six month period of time. Right, because it's not yeah. GPR. So that in yeah. this case, for 360A, if a parent is whereabouts unknown, and one of the parents, their whereabouts are, are known, and that parent is willing to wave up or to do a 360A guardianship, um, then the case can go by way of 360A as long as they do it in the day. But in, before moving on to 360B, I just want to say 360A, I think there's a good chance that each one of our firms has a case heading for a 26 right now that probably could have benefited at least from discussion about 368 at some point. My second so question it's an is about thing to consider. Yes. My second question is about the waiver of FR. Do you have any information about whether that can be completed by a court call and then filed later? I know it has to be witnessed, but you know, is there did you run across anything about whether that can be done off site through court call? I mean I think it would be dependent on the court. Some, I think some judges will be, if you are representing to the court that these are the steps you took and the court's fine taking it, but I don't know if every court would be okay with taking that. Okay. Um, and I do also, I, I didn't really um, touch on this, um, but obviously if you're dealing with someone who is regional center, for example, and you, anyone who's had regional center cases knows that they can be the worst. So if you can get legal guardianship, try to do it. Um, but obviously, they have to be of sound mind to fill out this paper. Does it, does it still have the time limit required? The time in the home by the child, the six month time required? For can get? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions about 368? Okay, so 360B. Um, I think that there's a lot of tendency with 360B, and I mean, to summarize what it does, basically, it's like a, a court order 301 contract. Um, there's a sustained petition, and then the family and the social worker enter a period of family maintenance services that's not court supervised. Um, and, you know, what are the advantages? Well, the minors aren't declared dependents. Uh, there are no future court dates, assuming formal <laughs> supervision is successful. Um, it's one less case for everyone to worry about. And this isn't something that you can tell clients, but you know, I think we can all suspect that maybe they give these cases less priority, but we don't know that. Um, 
My concern um, is that I think 360B is overused um, and not sufficiently explained to a client before people argue 360B or um, uh, uh, try to settle a case for a 360B disposition. Um, so one thing to remember is that there is still a sustained petition. Um, I think most clients don't want a sustained petition, bottom line. Um, so if you're starting out with, well, there's a sustained petition, you might have already lost them. Um, so there are real world implications such as CACI. Um, there are plenty of people wandering around the courthouse right now who think that if this is DEJ, it's not. The sustained petition is not subject to dismissal if they complete all the programs. Um, and filing a 360C petition, which is what happens if things don't work out in this informal supervised period, um, is no more difficult for the social worker than a 342 or 387. So, um, and so, and that 301 contract is one that the social worker always said we don't want to do, right? So we know the social worker isn't into it. Um, and it may be that the client is fine with it or not. That's definitely something that you need to find out from your client. Um, obviously, uh, we lose a case um, and they lose a lawyer, so they need to understand that if they're having the issues with the social worker, if they feel like the judge needs to make an order or something isn't working out, they don't have that option. Um, and if you're going in with a case that needs to be dismissed and you're arguing for alternatively a 360B petition, that might be what the judge chooses, even though really it should just be a straight dismissal. Um, and just for your information, regardless of what the court does on the 360B, that would be held to an abuse of discretion standard by the appellate court. Um, now this isn't to say you should never uh, consider 360B. Uh, there may very well be cases where it is absolutely appropriate for your client, um, but you're going to want to be able to tell the court that your um, client's going to be cooperative, obviously. Um, and I, I, but I think ultimately, like, if, if you feel like you can sit down and take the time with your client and really <laughs> tell them, because it's a, it's a really, it's a very sort of narrow result, right? You still have a sustained petition and then the court goes away and I'm stuck with a social worker. And so, I mean, if you want to have that conversation with your client and you actually think this is worth considering for them, and then fine. Especially if it's something where um, the department is trying to push it as a settlement and, and you think they may be open to it. If that's what they want, then great, that's what they want. I just don't know that it makes sense, and if anyone disagrees with me, fine, to consider 360B as a strategy move. I don't think it's a strategy. I think that it is, um, if it's what your client wants, fine but it's not resulting in dismissal, and it may not be, you may end up going out of the courtroom and explaining to them what just happened, and they say, that's not what I wanted. Um, so just keep all of those things in mind with 360B. Yes? I just wanted to make one comment. Um, something else to consider, too, is that the disposition that is remember it's not a court order disposition so they're, they're not the course i'm going to say yes i'm ordering this person to do a drug program right. or i'm not so there's many times if you know that your court would not order them to do certain programs mm -hmm. <coughs> and the social worker recommending it then that then we should just keep the case open i mean so just just remember that and that's so important because we'll have these cases where a guy says yeah i smoked weed once and they're like okay so we can get him to test for the next six months which is not necessarily appropriate Right. Good point. Um, I did include um, a, this is 360C where uh, the department can uh, file to reopen the case if things don't work out. And the language is that they're subsequently unable or unwilling to cooperate with the services being provided. I actually want to ask if anyone has seen a 360C <laughs> petition that merely alleges that they have not comply with the case plan because we see 387s like that all the time <laughs> and we see a 360C that, that, where that is the mere allegation. Okay. One time. Okay. Ten years. Because you can't read this, but it says 
It's a 360C position that we got recently, and, and it's just like this family is falling apart. It is not just failure to comply with court orders. It's physical abuse and new DV, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not as if they were just like, they're not doing the programs. Um, so, but apparently it's not unheard of. Yes. Um, so if we get one of those 360C petitions where they allege new incidences or the things you were just describing, what do you suggest we do in response to that? Like if it doesn't contain this language that you have captured in the example and right. rather instead just says, and they got into this new DV incident and dad's still drinking and whatever the problems are, how, how should we respond? I mean, should we tell them they should be filing a new 300 entirely? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that that's, those are the alternatives. Um, I, I, I think we're stuck with a, it's basically a new petition with our own client. Is that yeah. what you were, okay. okay. Um, so, and now, moving on. 350C. Um, this is one, again, where I think we should be using it more frequently. Um, it's a really great tool. If you find yourself um, wondering, especially in those moments where you're like, I don't know if I should call my client to testify, da, 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 just remember 350C, right? Because maybe you don't need to call your client to testify. Maybe a 350C will be granted and you can just get what you want without it. So, it's um, obviously, it's basically a motion for a directed verdict. Um, it can be used at any hearing in which the agency has the verdict. It's not just for adjudication. Use it at the statutory review. We have the presumption the court shall return, right? So, it's a bit of burden to prove detriment. Um, if you think they haven't, if, if the evidence just isn't there, or if they they haven't met the burden of showing they made reasonable efforts. Use 350C. Um, make the motion immediately after Department of Minors Council rest, so you might have to cut in line with other parents' attorney. Um, uh, the only issue is if, is if at that time uh, the department has met its burden, and then you can present evidence if the motion is denied. So, <clears throat> um, if you have a bad family law case, you might want to consider using it just to kind of, if minor's counsel is on your side in particular, if you want to try to um, thwart the other parent from piling on, um, the judge might appreciate that as well. Um, so, the second point uh, where you've got all of the evidence in, including evidence to rebut any presumption. So I brought that up because there was a case in 421 recently where um, parents' counsel, it was an e-case, parents' counsel had provided the department with a letter from their expert. The department inadvertently, I think, included it in some of their evidence. And so they were like, well, shoot, let's just argue 350C and argue that we've rebutted the Assumption and it was granted. It was pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, so that's just yeah, right. I know. Um, so if you've got uh, enough in the record to argue that a witness is not credible, um, go ahead and make that argument under 350C because maybe the court will agree, um, and you won't give that witness the opportunity to clear things up. Um, if you've got an issue where you can't decide whether to call your client, do a 350C motion. Um, even if you think your client, like a lot of times we know our client would testify really well as to all the relevant issues. There's just one thing we really hope and pray no one asks. Um, so um, use it then. And again, right, if you have a case with a number of counts, you might be able to um, get a few of them knocked out. Um, do you have to present evidence if the 350C motion is denied? Yes, basically. I mean, there are probably exceptions to the rule. Yes? So I know 
a question about, so in my practice, I will make a 350C motion, and a lot of times the court doesn't understand what that is, so I'll specifically state, I'm making a 350C motion, and if that motion is denied, I'm prepared to go forward in my defense. Um, and then that motion is either, the idea being that then they understand that we still will have evidence to put on if the 350C motion is denied. Now, I have observed other attorneys actually sort of putting on an argument in the midst of their 350C motion. Um, do you have an opinion about what's better practice? So, let me just make sure I'm understanding your question. You're saying that you basically say, I'm asking the court to dismiss pursuant to 350C, but I'm done. Right. I think you can make a full argument right then and there. I, I think that actually 350C, next slide, requires the court both to consider all of the evidence then before it, not only the evidence most favorable to the agency, and to weigh that evidence. So I think argument is absolutely appropriate there. And actually another great benefit to 350C is I think it can be used as an opening statement, even if you know it's not going to be granted. Um, it can help to narrow the issues, it can help to really kind of get the court on your side before you present evidence. Um, but I, absolutely, I think argument is 100% um, warranted at the 350C to try to really persuade the court to make that ruling. Yeah. Um, yes. Hi. I'm going to go in the back here. <laughs> I think the distinction is some judges, when you go to make your 350C argument, think you're done with your case. So the distinction is, I agree with you, I believe if you're going to make a 350C argument, what you're telling the court is neither county council nor minors council right. has pro provided enough evidence to sustain the petition. Now the court can agree with you or not. Mm -hmm. The problem is some judges think when you've done that, it's you're over. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? You just argued, you know, that was your closing. And I think what Emily is saying is in order to preserve an affirmative defense, if some judges, especially the new judges that don't understand what people to see is, I think what she is saying is, Your Honor, <laughs> I am now going to argue for you now that Miners Council and County Council have finished their case in chief mm -hmm. that they have not provided sufficient evidence to sustain this petition. I think you'll agree with me. But if you don't, I will put on an affirmative defense. Now, an affirmative defense means you're going to put on the evidence. Right. And then ev evidence means you're going to put something into evidence, put a witness on the stand because we've had unfortunate experiences where judges will say, well, no, no, you're done. You're done. You need your argument. So it's just to dis distinguish between the PC argument and that you're now not precluded from putting on an affirmative defense. It's in the statute. There's lots of things in the statute. <laughs> <laughs> that have to do with the bench over there. Right. So, Right, but I mean, new attorneys do not be afraid if the judge tries to shut you down. Right. Make, that's what we're saying. Make sure they understand you're going to put on I mean, I think say whatever you need to say to remind the court that you're going to be putting on a case after if it is denied, sure. But I don't think that you want to forego making an actual no, no, go of it and making an argument at that time. Yes. Uh, just quickly a reminder that you can also use a 350C to argue that the court should dismiss certain counts, for right. example, the whole petition, as well as amending things to proof. So even on cases where you don't think that you're going to get a full dismissal, you can make that argument pursuant to 350C. And some judges, just to say, some judges will not allow argument at a 350C right. and technically argue that you know, argument is not evidence. So if your judge says no, they're within their rights, just be aware. Yes. What if you're in a courtroom in which, um, what if you're in a courtroom in which the uh, county council as well as minors attorneys always 
rest subject to rebuttal. So <laughs> technically they're not putting on anything because they always wait for the parents to make their argument and then they respond. Well, they're still resting in terms of evidence. Right? So they're just going to basically, because it's just basically what they indicated the report. Right. Right, the county. Right, so uh, if they're not, they're not saying, well, I might have more evidence based on what they say. Yeah, so they still rest it. <laughs> so that's after when they move all their documents or their reports? Like they're at the end. Yeah, yeah or the Miners Council submits some documents to the kids there says, and that's after that we make our motion. Any other questions? Yes. So if we have a county council that calls the DI and questions them, and then we cross the DI, have we then waived our ability to do the 350C, or can we still make it afterwards? Absolutely. I, I mean, that's still their case in chief. And you have to question their witness. That doesn't impact once, you know, okay, so you're done county, great. Minor is yes. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Oh, right, okay, so you've made your 350C motion, it's been denied. I think there are very, uh, there may be, maybe it's a bad family law case and you only made the 350C motion to try to thwart the other parent, or whatever it may be. So if it was for some strategic reason that you were making the 350C other than um, uh, not having, or not being sure if you wanted to put in certain evidence or something like that, um, then, then maybe in those instances, but by and large the rule is you shouldn't be using 350C unless you have some evidence that you're going to be putting forward um, should that 350C motion be denied. Otherwise you're just going to argument or you're just going to, you're just putting your case on. Um, um, if you have, like for example, if, if your argument is this witness isn't credible, it's obvious in the forensic, it's obvious <coughs> in the reports, and the court says, well, I'm denying your motion, then put the witness on, especially if they're there. Um, it's, you don't want to be in a situation where um, it's just found to be ineffective to not have called that witness if they're there. Um, and it really, it just doesn't, it just doesn't, it's not good practice to, to use 350C and then just argue after it's done. So something to consider. Other practice tips. Again, remember to use for any hearing where the department has a burden. Um, remember 355 subpoenas or any minors to be present. Um, and I think that if you have a board and you've got your case number and you've got a million witnesses next to it, It'll make your 350C that much more attractive, right? Because the court will be like, let's just. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, as um, Ms. Einstein pointed out, it's not, uh, you don't have to do it toward the whole petition. Um, if the motion is denied, you can ask the court to state the reason for the record. It could help to narrow the issues going forward. Um, and then again, if you want to try to push for argument, it's true. They don't have to let you. Uh, a couple more practice tips um, brought up by case law. In, the, in, in Ray Emily D, um, in the 350C motion, they brought up the fact that there were tests out in the world that had not been provided, and so the court just continued it so the department could supplement the record. And then this pre-fifty-c motion was denied. Um, also, the court can continue it and can allow the department to supplement the record at the next court date. So, um, just be aware uh, to try to make your pre-fifty-c motion in such ways to not highlight missing things if you can. Um, and that is all I've got. Any questions? 
And unless there's questions, guys, we're going to have to send out modified certificates for 0.75 hours because of the state <laughs> So ask Sorry. your questions. <laughs> yes. So I have a question about the continuances in the 350C. If it's a no time waiver trial, can the court. It's oh. on. You might need this to be on. Hello. Hello. Um, if it's a no time waiver trial, can the court continue to um, con continue for any reason to collect more evidence? I don't think so. Okay. That's a good point. And then if it's a trial that's but over. But I mean, then again, it's already been started. The department's already. I don't know. If it's a trial that's over 60 days, the 60 day limit, can they still continue? Six months? Yeah. Six months, I'd say no. Six yeah. months is no, but right. 60 days is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Thank you. That's in the best interest of the child. Right. right. You're always going to let the evidence stand. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any more questions, guys? Yeah, look. I'll just talk about it. Um, yeah, so we got to have Lancaster here. Just repeat the question. Oh, okay. Oh, right there. Okay, so I was under this grave misapprehension that 360B results in like, a deferred entry of judgment. Um, is there any other mechanism for that other than the 301 contract? Is there any other mechanism for. To achieve a deferred entry of judgment? There's no, there, we don't really have it, unfortunately. It'd be nice maybe if we did, but we don't. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. When 360, when 360 um, B was created, it was supposed to be the corollary to the deferred entry of judgment in the, in the delinquency court where you actually get the petition dismissed. We don't have that. so. It's something that our ledge committee, I, I've been bitching for years, that it needs to be amended because the bottom line is, what is the 360B? Because if a 360C is never refiled, it's just by some kind of thing it's floating out there. The petition was sustained, the child's never been made a dependent, what benefit it has for our client, I'm not sure. So many years ago, some of the commissioners tried to remedy that by setting progress reports to bring mm -hmm. the case back so that they could dismiss the petitions. And they used to say, well, well, how else can a petition be dismissed? Because there's no mechanism. And we fought against that because we said, the law doesn't give you jurisdiction once you do a 360B. So the truth is, we don't have a remedy right now. But we do need the differentiated of judgment remedy. We don't have it right now. More questions? Let's do this, guys. Let's do it. Let's make an hour. Yes. Can the order of family preservation on a 360B? So well, I mean, free services for your the judge can't. Right. Can the question was, can they order 360B? But the judge really can't make the judge isn't taking jurisdiction. So no order. No. I mean, I don't know if they can informally arrange it amongst themselves. Maybe, but it can't be an order. Yes. I just wanted to point out that sometimes um, the 360B is also makes it more difficult for our clients to get services because they're not. Right. So that's something that's important. Exactly. They won't be necessarily engaging in services. Which could be something that they prefer. She was just saying it could be difficult for them to get services under 360B. Right. They don't have any backstop. There's no lawyer to call. There's no judge to enforce anything. Um, but if they want to fly under the radar, then maybe that's preferable. Forgive me if I missed it, but I don't think you talked about appealing the order of a 360B, so I wanted to clarify. So I actually have a 360B appeal up right now. I've been looking at the Court of Appeal website every day for the past, oh, I don't know, <laughs> six months waiting for the response because I would love to get this particular case overturned. But so um, it should have been a straight up dismissal and instead SOTO for the 360B. So I just want everyone to be aware, because I know there have been 
the idea that you can only found the appeal after the disposition makes people a little confused. So I just wanted to clarify, you can absolutely appeal 360D when you're trying to get to the Yes, and I should have been more clear. I, I mentioned what the standard is on appeal, <laughs> but yes, you can appeal a 360B disposition. Thank you, Ms. Berger. So on a 350C, killing time here, <laughs> if you have a bench officer who routinely tries to let minors counsel go last, they can't because minors counsel has to put forward their case in chief for you to move on a 350C. I'm not sure what the solution is when the other parent counsel, Ladle, refuses to let you go first other than strangling them at counsel tables. Okay, so as to strangling, <laughs> oh, uh, supervisor's giving you permission for the next time. Thank you. Um, but again, it's it's not whether or not minor has argued; it's whether or not minor has rested. So, and and just jump in. I mean, they can't stop you from talking. Once minor has rested, <laughs> can they? Oh, well. oh. Yes. <laughs> so for the for the the B one, um, sometimes it's not really clear what they're going to be doing once the when when it goes into effect. Do you recommend that maybe we should? talk to the department so our clients walk away with a clear understanding as to what they're going to be doing. So um, maybe the department doesn't decide to make them do a full drug program when all that was talked about was testing. But who's going to hold the department to that? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, well, if they put it in their I, last I wouldn't... minute, <laughs> they can file an appeal. But it's unsupervised family maintenance, okay. and I, I just don't think there's any appellate remedy to what they end up telling them to do. <laughs> Is there something specific that says that the court cannot set a case plan at a 360B? Because I've seen some bench officers do it, yep. and I know that that's not, you know, how it's supposedly done, but I've also, from what I've heard, seen the department will tend to defer to that if that's done. I, I, but do we know? Right? And that's the thing. I, I mean, unless it comes back, which we don't want it to, obviously, I just don't think that there's any enforcement mechanism for that. Maybe that is what the department will end up doing. It, that's the thing with 360 just enters in complete unknown. Territory. Yes. Well, under 350C, you know what you were talking about before. I could see in some of the custody battles where one party wants to have the petition dismissed, right. and the other party really wants the petition to be sustained, and maybe that's even a non-offending parent who's really trying to go after the other parent. So there is going to be a little bit of a contest as to who speaks first, because it may not be in your client's interest for the petition to be dismissed if you really want allegations against the other parent. So I can see two ladles going after it as to who jumps in first. Right. Because they're going to be, no, Your Honor, don't dismiss. We think it's really important that you sustain this petition. But the other ladle going, no, 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 my interest counsel is rested. I have a right to challenge the sufficiency of the evidence. So. We could take them a little bit in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I know some courtrooms will, you know, allow county council and minors council. We touched on this briefly to you know, reserve until the parents have made their arguments already. Could this? be not abused but used to force the minors council and county council to go first and sort of show their cards so we know what to respond to and so again an argument later I, I i i think that there's a conflation of putting your evidence in and resting 
and arguing. And two different things. So just because, I mean, the department isn't saying I'm not putting in my evidence until after the parents do. They're, they put in their evidence. And then the court goes to minors' counsel. Then you have the evidence, you they don't. That's when you use the 350C. It doesn't matter whether they say a word about why they believe the case should be sustained or dismissed or whatever their position is. OK. Um, and minors' counsel will sometimes join with the 350C. Actually. And sometimes I've seen minors' counsel make the 350C motion. So it's not. It, it's not about whether they're arguing. It's about whether they're they rested on their evidence. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Speaking to Matt's broader point, I think a lot of these issues could also be solved by communicating with other counsel before you just go in there and make a 350C. You want to know what other people's positions are. You want to talk to minors counsel. You want to talk to their legal. So if they're aligned with you then they're going to let you jump in and make your 350C. Yep. In fact, I've seen minors counsel make a 350C, right. and then you end up joining in minors counsel. So, you know, don't shoot from the hip, figure out what people are doing, and, you know, strategize accordingly. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can also conference cases, too. If you're afraid your, jump, your bench officer doesn't know what a 350C is, you might want to say, hey, I'm going to do this thing. <laughs> yeah. you ready. Especially, especially at statutory review hearings, I schooled Zeke on the record that we can see that. And he said, oh, you can. You're right. It says right there. He was nice about it. Okay. But is there any way we can, so some judges, even if you make the 350C motion, minor counsel's rested, I understand what you're saying. Evidence is close. It's done. Right. A lot of judges, take what the minor's counsel's argument is into consideration when they're making a ruling because they're basically coming in with, well, the kid is saying this or that or whatever the kid is saying, and they're you know, adding their guidance as to their position. Is there any way we can prevent the minor's counsel from arguing when you make the 350C motion? I don't think so. There's nothing we can do. I don't think so because Typically, in what I've seen when I've made the motion or when I've seen other people make the motion, is other people will argue their position on the motion. So, which seems appropriate. Um, just to weigh in on that, they can't argue it's not in evidence. Right, right. So when they start saying they have concerns. If that, if, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but they're concerned and their yeah. kid told them five minutes ago in the back that yeah. X, Y, or Z happened, that's not. Yeah. Yeah, but we all know how that really so is. Them. Well, they have a duty. <laughs> okay, so okay, so your question was more about concerns that my counsel will start testifying. Well, they, I mean, I it's mean, not uncommon. Yes, no, no, it's not. And yeah. we're always the bad guy when we right. point it out. Right. right. We're the bad but, guy but they could do that. At, they can do that at argument on a 350C. They can do that at argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Not, not a question, but just piggybacking on that. Again, you do have to object when minors counsel does that, even though it makes you the bad guy, because if you don't object to their statements, there's some case law that they may be able to be considered as evidence. So you have to make that objection every time, even when you have a bench officer who's like, oh, whatever, it's argument, you know, make the objection. How much more time do we have? <laughs> There's my kitten picture. Okay. Yeah, that was a good Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>